Pilate got into his uh, plane and took off from the East Coast, headed east, doing a transatlantic flight. This was uh, in the early days of transatlantic flying. He was flying solo. No one else was in the plane with him. And as he was uh, heading out over the Atlantic Ocean, he began to hear some noise in the, behind the control panel in front of him. Kept flying. A little while later, he began to notice there were some things dropping down onto the floor by his feet paper stuff. He discerned that it must be insulation off the wiring behind the control panel and he began to worry. What is it that's making that noise that's behind the control panel eating at the, well, the insulation on the wiring and is he going to get to the place where he eats through something really important? Feel, feel, he uh, discerned that it must be some kind of a rodent. He tried to discern what it, ought, what it is he ought to try to do, and he, he couldn't really think of much to do. He couldn't very well turn back and head back toward the East Coast because he was too far away, and surely the rodent would do something drastic before then, and he wouldn't make it back. He couldn't keep heading toward the East, toward Europe, because he was sure he wouldn't make it there without running into some problem because of the damage the rodent was doing. Couldn't very well let go of the controls and crawl down on the floor and look up underneath the control panel because that would be instant doom. Finally, he thought of something he could do. So he strapped on his oxygen mast, and he went higher, and he went higher, and he went higher, and he went higher, until the atmosphere changed, and the rodent fell dead on the floor at his feet. And then he came back down and finished his flight to Europe. That rat died because of a different atmosphere. I'm talking today about giving. And what I want to emphasize today is the atmosphere with which we should give. Because there are, there's a negative atmosphere and there's a positive atmosphere out of which we can give. And, and when we adopt the kind of atmosphere that brings a negative aspect to giving, uh, then we rob giving of the kind of joy and, and life that it ought to have that God wants it to have in our lives. A legalistic atmosphere of obligation, the atmosphere of guilt by which some people give, that arm-twisting manipulation by which some people give, that robs giving of the kind of attitude and atmosphere that God desires for it to have. The Bible never teaches that we ought to give out of a sense of guilt or out of a sense of being, having our arms twisted. That's not what God desires as we give to his kingdom and what he wants to accomplish. Rather, God has given us the privilege of giving. It's a, a grace, a gift that he's given to us. That's the point that the Apostle Paul makes when he wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. He's using the example of the Macedonians who were giving generously to meet the needs of the church in Judea. And the point that he makes is the gift of the Macedonians was something that they viewed as a privilege. It was a gift from God that allowed them to give to the kingdom needs. It was a grace in their lives that God had given to them. Listen to what Paul says, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial... Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not give as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus... Since he had earlier made a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part, but just as you excel in everything, in faith and speech and knowledge, in complete earnestness and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Three times he uses the word grace. He talks about overwhelming joy. He talks about the privilege that it is to give the willingness with which the Macedonians gave. God, when viewed, when we view giving from God's perspective, when we rightly view giving, we view it as a privilege, not as an obligation. We view it a a as a gift, not as a, a debt. We view it as an opportunity to express love, not as an opportunity to be motivated by guilt. It's a grace. Grace is a beautiful word. 
It's a word that originally meant uh, to something that was attractive or appealing. And so it came to be used of all the gifts that came to us from God because all the gifts that God gives to us are attractive. All of them are appealing. Giving is a gift. It's, it's attractive. It's appealing. It's not something that we are to be manipulated to do. It's not something that we are to be forced into doing. It's attractive. It is appealing. It's something that we want to do. And so in talking specifically about the giving that Paul mentions here in 2 Corinthians 8, the example of the Macedonians, I want to point out three attitudes of this kind of giving that God desires all of us to have, this grace giving. And so we say first that grace giving is sacrificial giving. That is, that grace giving is giving that costs us something. There's something that we have to give up because we give to the kingdom in the way that we do. And you can see that so very clearly in the example of the Macedonians because they did not give out of their wealth, but rather they gave out of their poverty. And so their giving very clearly was sacrificial giving. They could have used the money they were giving to support the church in Judea. They could have used that for their own needs, but they chose instead to give to the needs of God's kingdom. Paul says of them in chapter 8, verse 2, out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Paul made it very clear that the Macedonians were not giving out of their great prosperity, but rather quite the opposite. They were giving out of their extreme poverty. Paul calls their situation a most severe trial. It's a very serious economic situation in which the Macedonians found themselves and out of which they gave so generously to the needs of the church in Judea. The pressure that they were under had put them in extreme poverty, Paul says. Which is not the kind of poverty that you and I sometimes experience when we think we're poorer because we can't have the things that some other people that we know can have. We can't keep up with the people down the street or the people across town or the people whose lives we see on television. And so we think that we're living in poverty. But that's not the kind of poverty that Paul is talking about that was being experienced by the Macedonians. Theirs was extreme poverty which carries the connotation that they were almost at the point of begging. That's how poor the Macedonians were. And yet they gave with rich generosity. Eugene Peterson paraphrases that verse. He says, fierce troubles came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. The trial exposed their true colors. They were incredibly happy, though desperately poor. And that's where the Macedonians were when they gave so generously to the needs of God's kingdom. Now you have to admit, that doesn't make sense to us. Extreme poverty and rich generosity don't seem to go hand in hand. In fact, they seem to be at polar opposites. That those who are in extreme poverty, we don't expect from them rich generosity. But God added grace to their difficulty, and he enabled them and allowed them to be richly generous even in the midst of their extreme poverty. In God's economy, 2 plus 2 doesn't always equal 4. It doesn't always add up as logical, not in God's economy. In fact, one of the most amazing statistics that, that you can find about giving comes out of the giving patterns of Americans, people here in the United States who live in, in such prosperity. Our logical thought is that the charitable giving, including giving to the church in the United States, surely must be the story of incredible generosity among those who are wealthy. But that is not the story of American giving. Although logical, it doesn't represent the truth. The truth is that those who can least afford it are those who give the largest percentage of their income. Statistics are available from 2011. Those are the last statistics of, are available. And, and if you take the top 20% of people based upon income in the United States, that tier of people in the United States give on average 1.3% of their income to charitable causes, the church and other charitable causes. That's the top tier. You move to the bottom tier, the bottom 20% of people based upon income in the United States give an average of 3.2% of their income 
to the United States. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. That those who are in the bottom tier as a percentage of income give more than those who are in the top tier. And that's amplified by the realization that those who are in the bottom tier benefit less by the tax deduction they get than those who are in the top tier do. See, it's not how much we have, but what we do with what we have that makes all the difference. That's the lesson of the Macedonian churches. For Paul told the Corinthians in chapter 8, verse 12, For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what he does not have. Grace giving is not found in the amount of the gift that we give, but in the sacrifice that it represents. So grace giving is sacrificial giving. Secondly, grace giving is voluntary giving. Grace giving is not motivated by love or by guilt. It's not motivated by force. It's not motivated by law. Grace giving is motivated by love. And so whenever love comes into a person's life, it automatically and naturally changes a person's priorities and the way they want to spend their money. So a man can go through his life and somewhere along the line he picks up a golf club for the first time and the bug catches him and his priorities are changed. Whereas before he, he, he was, didn't want to spend money on anything, now he'll spend 50 bucks to go play a round of golf and 150 bucks on a new driver. Not because he has to, not because anybody's forcing him to, but because his heart has been changed. And he wants to spend money on his new passion on golf. Or take a young man who's enthralled with cars. And, and he spends every dime he can get a, his hand on on his car. Tricking it up, putting chrome here and there and yon. And buying new wheels that are fancy and new tires. And, and, and polishing it up with the best wax that he can get. And spending time and spending money on this car that is his idol. The thing that he loves the most in the world. And then he notices this young girl and his heart is taken and all of a sudden his car doesn't get waxed as often and there's no new chrome pieces appearing on it because all of his money is going toward dates, taking her out to eat and going to the movies. Not because he has to. Not because she's guilting him into it, forcing him in some way, but because his heart has been stolen and his priorities automatically and naturally change. When there's love in our lives, it creates a compulsive desire to give and then to give even more voluntarily to the point of sacrifice. The compulsion is not externally imposed, it's internally motivated. It comes from a person's heart. And so the secret then of the giving of the Macedonian Christians was simple. They gave voluntarily. They gave entirely on their own, Paul says in chapter 8, verse 3. In fact, their giving went beyond just being voluntary. Paul says in verse 4, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing. Love had invaded their hearts. And because their hearts had been changed, they wanted to give. They begged for the opportunity to be allowed to give to meet the needs of God's kingdom. When we fall in love with Jesus, that love creates a desire in our hearts, in our lives, to be generous to the needs of the kingdom of Jesus. There's only one motive that's sufficient for the financial challenges of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And that motive is love. For Jesus. Appreciation for what he has done for us. I've always been impressed with the story that's told in 1 uh, Chronicles chapter 29. It's a story of when the people of Israel gathered the money that would be necessary in order to build this marvelous temple to the honor and glory of the God whom they loved so much. Now, we know the story that David was not allowed to build the temple because he had been such a man of war during the days in which he was king. But God did grant to David the privilege of being the chief fundraiser uh, for the temple. And so he took on the task of raising all the funds that were necessary for the construction of the temple so that when he left the kingship, when he died, and Solomon took over, Solomon would have everything that he needed, and he wouldn't have to do any fundraising. He could get right at, to work building this new temple that God would allow Solomon to build. 
And so David started the process himself, and he made an enormous gift from his own personal wealth and from the treasury of the king, and that started the giving toward what was needed to construct the temple. And then he turned to the leaders, and he invited them to give. And then he turned to the people, and he invited them to give to the building of the temple too. And there's one thing that just jumps out of this story about the giving of David, about the giving of the leaders, about the giving of the people too, and that is the attitude with which they gave to the needs for the construction of the temple. They gave so generously. And that attitude starts with David's challenge to those who would bring their gifts for the construction of the temple. David said, this is in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 5, now who is willing to consecrate himself today to the Lord. He called the willing, those who volunteered to give of their wealth, those who wanted to be a part of this construction project of building the temple. It was the willing that were called to participate. And next, David turned to the leaders who would bring their gifts for the temple. And he said to them, this is in chapter 29, verse 6, Then the leaders of the families, the officers, the tribes of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands, the commanders of hundreds, the officials in charge of the king's work, gave willingly. And the people noticed the attitude with which their leaders gave. Chapter 29, verse 9, the people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord and David the king also rejoiced greatly the leaders gave willingly they gave voluntarily they gave freely to the need David himself gave with that same attitude and he saw that same attitude among the people as they brought their gifts to this construction project first chronicles 29 verse 17 I know my God this is David talking I know, my God, that you test the, the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things have I given willingly and with honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. It was the willing response of David. It was the willing response of the leaders. It was the willing response of the people that was so noticed in this fundraising for the construction of the temple. There was a huge amount of money that was raised for building the temple. Literally billions of dollars in today's dollars were raised in that era to construct this marvelous building that was built to the glory of God. And all that was given, all that was given, was given by those who were willing, by those who volunteered, by those who wanted to give. Or go back to another illustration. This one comes from the season in which Moses was leading the people of Israel and God had instructed Moses to lead the people to build this portable site of worship, the tabernacle, this tent that they would move from place to place as they wandered in the wilderness that was the precursor to the temple that Solomon would later build. And so God told Moses what kind of offering was to be received for the construction of this tabernacle. It's in Exodus uh, chapter 25, verses 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. Same thing that you see in the building of the temple. It was those who were prompted to give. Those who wanted to give. Those who gave from their heart, those who were willing, those who gave voluntarily, motivated by love. And so when it came time to actually receive the offering, which is recorded in Exodus uh, chapter 36, you see what, what happened when the people gave willingly, when they gave voluntarily. They gave and they continued to give and then they gave some more to the point that those who were constructing the tabernacle came to Moses and they said to Moses, tell the people to stop. They've given too much. Exodus uh, chapter 36, verse 5. It says, uh, those who were building the temple, they came and they said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. And so Moses gave an order. And his order was, no man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. 
And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they had already had was more than enough to do all the work. Out of willing hearts, motivated by love, voluntarily, they gave more than needed to be given so that Moses had to tell the people, stop giving, you've given too much, we have everything that we need for the work that God is calling us to do. That's the kind of giving that God desires. Giving that is willing. Giving that's motivated by love. Giving that's motivated by the heart. Giving that comes out of the voluntary decision of the people of God. That's the kind of giving. Without any exterior compulsion motivated solely by what go is going on inside our hearts, that's the kind of attitude that God desires to develop among those of us who give. Sacrificial giving, voluntary giving, and thirdly, grace giving is spiritual giving. You'll go back to the example of the Macedonian Christians in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and what we notice there is that the giving of the Macedonians is an outward expression of what was going on inside of their hearts, an outward expression of their inner relationship with the Lord. And so Paul said to the Macedonians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5, and they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. They gave their lives to the Lord, then they gave their money to Paul. They gave their lives to the Lord. That's where it started first. There's, there is giving, some giving, that is unspiritual and has ulterior motives. And that kind of giving does not please the Lord. The kind of giving that pleases the Lord is giving that comes out of the kind of relationship that we have with God himself. Jesus spoke of one wrong motive for giving. He said in, in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. Giving that's done to impress others with how rich you are or how generous you are or how spiritual you are or whatever it is you're trying to impress people by, by letting them know what you give. That doesn't honor God. The kind of giving that honors God is the kind of giving that comes out of your heart because you want to, not the kind of giving that comes because you want other people to be impressed by you. Another form of unspiritual giving is giving that comes from the twisted arm. Paul told the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, each one should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God is not pleased with giving that comes reluctantly or out of some sense of obligation, but rather that comes from joy because we want to give, because we're giving cheerfully. The story that comes out of suburban about 20 years ago or so, uh, David and her buddy and Brandy Sturm's uh, oldest daughter, Lonnie, was just a little girl at that time. The offering had been taken. It was only in the old auditorium and the ushers were leaving the auditorium going into the foyer. My wife happened to be standing in the foyer at that time when the ushers were coming out. And as the ushers came out of the auditorium, they were followed by this little girl running after them, Lonnie. And she, she grabbed the, the hem of the closest usher and she started pulling on this gal's skirt. And the gal turned around and looked down at little Lonnie and little Lonnie lifted up her arms with this grin of delight on her face and had her offering in her hand. Somehow, the offering had missed this little girl. And there was no way that she was going to be left out. Because she got such delight in giving to the Lord that she chased the ushers down to make sure that she could put her gift in the offering. That's the kind of giving that gives God glory. So, uh, we've already taken our offering, so none of you are going to be able to run after the ushers to so make sure that you get your offering in there. But that's the kind of giving that, that brings God glory. Giving that comes out of, a, out of a heart that really wants to give, that's delighted with the opportunity, that has joy because they're privileged to be able to give like that to the Lord. Or maybe the worst form of giving is that which comes in an effort to buy God's favor. There's a story in the book of Acts that talks about that kind of giving. A man's name was Simon. It's in Acts chapter 8. And Peter saw what Simon was trying to do, buying God's gifts with his money. And he said to Simon, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. No amount of money could buy even the smallest gift that God would give to us. George Truett was a great preacher, built a great church in, in I believe it was in Dallas, Texas, 100 years ago or so. 
had a powerful presence in the pulpit. He preached with passion. One Sunday, uh, he was preaching a sermon about giving, and, and they were involved in some kind of a project, and so they were going to take this special offering, and he was challenging the people to be generous in the special offering that they were going to take for whatever project it was that they were undergoing. And so the ushers brought in these big baskets, wicker baskets, and that's what they were using in order to collect the offering. They were taking these wicker baskets down the aisle, and people were coming in the aisle, and they were placing their offerings in these big wicker baskets. And they got back to the back of the auditorium. There's this little boy who was sitting there close to the aisle, and he... He was a little boy. He didn't have anything to give. And so he did the only thing that he could think of to do. He climbed into the basket and gave himself. The usher thought about telling him to get out, but he thought better of it. And so he lifted the heavy basket with the little boy in it, and he carried it to the front of the auditorium, and he placed it there on the altar. And every eye in the auditorium was, was weeping. Even the men were crying, and they clamored for another chance. And they sent the baskets down the aisle one more time. And the second time, the offering was larger than it was the first time. Because they saw the example of a little boy who had nothing to give and gave the only thing that he could. He gave himself. Someone once described money as liquid life. That is, we take our energy and our time and our talents and we use them and convert them into money. So, you know, we get a salary. So that, that salary that we get in some way represents our life. It represents our energy. It represents our talents. It represents our hard work. So it's, it's a part of us. It's a part of our lives. It's liquid life. And we can take that and give it as we want to, willingly, sacrificially, and spiritually. When people catch the biblical spirit of giving, it changes our hearts. Giving is no longer drudgery or bill paying. Instead, it becomes an expression of love, an expression of faith, an expression of hope. Alfred Whitehead was a philosopher and he said uh, one of the greatest opportunities that we have, one of the things that wise men do is to plant trees they'll never sit under. And that's what we have an opportunity to do when we give to the needs of God's kingdom. There is a sense in which giving to the needs of God's kingdom allows us to bless our own lives and the people around us right now. But there's also a sense when we give to God's kingdom that we're planting trees that we'll never sit under. That we're helping spread the gospel in places we'll never go, to people we'll never see, the generations that will live longer than we will. And we're touching eternity with what we give, which is really planting trees that we'll never sit under, T touching lives for all of eternity. Paul said to the Macedonian Christians, of the Macedonian Christians, Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. Let's be sure we also excel in this grace of giving. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the privilege that it is to give to your kingdom. Your kingdom needs here. Your kingdom needs around the world. Kingdom needs today. Kingdom needs that will impact our children and our grandchildren and future generations, kingdom needs that will touch eternity. Lord, thank you for the privilege of supporting your work and enabling your work, funding your work. Out of hearts that adore you, that love you. Thank you, Father. Help us to excel in this grace of giving. In Jesus' name, amen.